over a century, the Murdochs were law and order here in the 14th Circuit. There are facts that don't add up and bodies tied to this family. The Murdochs would just make someone disappear. Y'all know Alec Murdoch? That's his son. Good luck. This is the setup for what we look at and what's going on. Middle-aged man who's outwardly successful, who has a strong family legacy, who has a prominence in the community and a reputation, but is living a lie. living alone. We may never truly understand why Alec Murdoch killed his wife and son on the Moselle property on the night of June 7, 2021. Murdoch's motive is complex, multifactorial, and open to interpretation. But to even begin to infer a motive in this case, you must first understand that Alec Murdoch is a unique individual with criminal and emotional intelligence. He lived a life of privilege, power, and prominence, and he used his gregarious personality to fast-talk and manipulate his way out of consequences or even confrontations. You must understand how he was treating his finances like a Ponzi scheme for over a decade, stealing money from his clients and his law firm to pay off old debts and fund his wealthy lifestyle. You must also understand what happened on the night of February 23, 2019, that resulted in the death of 19-year-old Mallory Beach and the alleged criminal and civil culpability of the Murdoch family, as well as the alleged obstruction of justice that followed. And lastly, you must understand how everything was coming to a head on June the 7th, and how the deaths of Maggie and Paul allowed Alec to momentarily escape accountability and keep that hamster wheel turning. Alec found a way to become a victim overnight and appeal to and exploit the sympathy of others, just like he was able to as a trial lawyer, earning millions of dollars in settlements, only to turn around and rob the victims of their monetary awards. In this video, I hope to walk you through the prosecution's theory as to motive for the double homicide, as well as shine some light from my own research into this series of tragedies, a southern saga of Shakespearean proportions. Once we get to the end of that journey, and you have a chance to deliberate. The evidence is going to be such that you're going to reach the inescapable conclusion that Alec murdered Maggie and Paul, that he was the storm, that the storm was coming for them, that the storm arrived on June 7, 2021, just like the storms that are heading here right now, that they died as a result, beyond any reason. And after the defendant was the one person who was living a lie, the defendant is the person on which a storm was descending and the defendant is a person where his own storm would actually mean consequences for Maggie and Paul and consequences for those who trusted him. And that person is the defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch. The defendant became so addicted and so dependent on a velocity of money that the millions of dollars in legal fees that he was receiving was not enough, and so he started to steal. And how did he steal? He stole by billing personal expenses to the firm. He stole by stealing from his own family. You heard the testimony about uh, the check he stole from his brother Randy. But then the main ways were two schemes that he developed. And the first one was to get checks made out from the client trust account to Palmetto State Bank to fast talk the staff and fast talk the clients with those disbursements and then take it to Palmetto State Bank where his buddy Russell Lafitte would convert those and use those to pay personal expenses. And each time until the end it worked because the client was also getting a big check and they were walking out of there thinking that everything had been fine when it was not. What were your observations of him as a lawyer? I think Alec um, was successful more off, not from his work ethic, but from his ability to establish relationships and to, to manipulate p 
people into settlements and clients into liking him. Um, so he did it through the art of bullshit, basically. For years, you were stealing money from clients. Yes, sir, I agree with that. And that you were stealing from your law firm. Yes, sir, I agree with that. And that had been going on since at least 2010. I'm not sure of the exact date, but it's been going on a long time. I'll agree with All that. Right, what's your best guess of the date? I'm not sure. I, I, have, you don't I, I don't take a dispute with 2010. I just don't know that for sure. So you got $800,000 attributed to you with the firm, but that was not enough. You also stole money from that teenager. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. You remember Hakeem, Hakeem Pinkney? Do you remember him? I do. What happened to him? Um... He was injured in the same wreck that Natasha Thomas was injured in. Was he badly injured? He was. Would have been credited with over four million in fees for that. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And was that enough for you? Was that enough for me? Mm -hmm. Or did you take more? Oh no! From I, 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 I took monies from Hakeem Pinkney that I that did not belong to me, that I should not have taken. Been rendered a paraplegic. No, sir. He was a quadriplegic, quadriplegic, unfortunately. Thank you for correcting. Yes, sir. You ultimately take money from his mother, Pamela, as well. I, I believe that I did. You remember how much money you took from, from a king? No, sir. Not off the top of my head. I do not. If I told you it was over $370,000, would you agree with that? If, if, if that's what the records show, I don't dispute that. Do you remember how much you took from the teenager Natasha Thomas in addition to your legal fees? Not off the top of my head, no, sir. If I told you it was over $350,000, would you agree with that? I don't dispute it. Do you remember how much you took from Arthur Badger? Not off the top of my head, no, sir. If it was over $1.3 million, would you agree with that? I don't dispute it. Dion suffered some pretty severe injuries, correct? Uh, Dion was hurt bad that I misstated it as $2 million. So you falsified the paperwork, correct? It, it, it appears that I put inaccurate information on the paperwork. Yes, sir. You put inaccurate information. You falsified it, right? If you like that word, yes, sir. It is Elise Mallory. And what happened in this case? I stole her money. What happened, though, with the underlying case? Can you tell the jury that? Do you remember that? Um, Eva, it was her daughter, mm -hmm. was uh, in a wreck. Did she die? And she got killed. And Miss Mallory came to you for help? She did. You remember that one? I at do. all? I okay. Really okay, we remember one now. Oh, no, Mr. Waters, I remember all of these people. Okay. I, it's not that I don't remember them. Uh -huh. You're just asking me details about conversations. Okay, great. I, I, I can promise you, I remember all of these people that I did wrong. All right, and you stole all of the money, didn't you? I, st I, st I stole all of, all of the money. Most, most of the money that I've been accused of stealing, I stole. No, I mean, you stole every single dime of the recovery. She didn't get one dime. Isn't that right? I have to look at the records, but if that's... You credited right. yourself with legal fees, and then you stole all the rest of the money, correct? I, I don't dispute that. I stole money that was not my money. I misled people that I shouldn't have misled, and I did wrong. I can tell you that. And I may be able to tell you specifically, in some instances, what I did or didn't do. All right. Well, good. Well, we'll do that. But the point that I'm asking you is, it's, it's not as just as simple as some paperwork. You had to sit down and deal with these people and convince them that you were telling them the truth in order to steal this money. Correct? Th that may not be true, because in some situations, I, I may not have had to do that. They may, they may have just trusted me to do it. Okay. So that's my point is I misled them. There's no question about that. But did I sit down in each particular instance and like, like you're breaking it down step by step? I can't say that. I can say I did wrong. I stole money that wasn't mine. 
and I shouldn't have done it. At what point in time did your family advise you that there was some media reporting about a settlement in the case? Yes. All right, and at that time, had you heard anything from Alec or Corey or Chad or anybody about a settlement in the case? No. And what, if anything, did you do after your family? Did they ask you to do anything? Uh, yeah, they said you might want to kind of follow up on it and kind of see. And did you make a phone call to Alec? Uh, yes. Right. And what month was that in? Uh, I believe the last time I talked to him was in June of 21. June of 21? Yes. Around the time of the murders? Yes. And what did you ask him? Uh, I can't believe what I asked him, but um, it was still making progress and be ready to settle, you know, by the end of the year. He told you it was still making progress and he was hoping to settle by the end of the year? Yes. Did he tell you that they had already gotten a settlement for $505,000? No. Did he tell you that they had already gotten a settlement for $3.8 million? No. Had he ever told you that there was an umbrella policy for $5 million? No. Did he ever mention to you anything about Forge? No. Did he mention anything to you about structuring any settlement? No. Did he, you give him permission to steal your money? No. Ultimately, in the wake of all of this, you've come to find out that there was a settlement for $505,000, correct? Uh, yes. And it was diverted by Alec Murdoch, correct? Yes. And ultimately, you've come to find out that there was a settlement under the umbrella policy uh, for $3.8 million, is that yeah. correct? Yes. Or thereabouts, correct? Yes. And a large proportion of that was diverted by Alec Murdoch, is that right? Yes. Did you ever get one cent from Alec Murdoch when he was still, uh, before all of this happened? No. And it took, after this happening, and it took a legal process for that to happen, is that right? Yes. And ultimately, is it your understanding that he confessed judgment to taking money from both of those, is that yes. right? In June of 2021, you made a call to him asking the status of this case, is that correct? Uh, I can't remember if he called me or if I called him, but yes, I talked to him in June of 2021. You talked to him in June of 2021? Yes. And there were reports in the media about that settlement, correct? Yes. We had the land deals, he's servicing this huge debt load, he constantly needs new money coming in, and this has been going on for more than a decade, a constant hamster wheel. The stress and the pressure of that would be extreme because it's been going on for so long, always having to stay one step ahead of the game, always having to beg, literally beg, borrow, or steal for over a decade to have the truth from being exposed. That's been going on all that time. The big cases, his partners think he straightened it out, and paid off his debts, but he hadn't. He's getting paid millions of dollars, but he's stealing on top of that. It's not enough to keep that hamster wheel going. In May of 2021, as we move into June, that's when Alex owned Paralegal got the expense check for the Ferris case, but not the fee check. He tried to raise that to Alec and couldn't get a straight answer. Tried to raise it to Chris Wilson and couldn't get a straight answer to his office. And so goes to Jeannie Seconder, and Jeannie Seconder goes to the partners, and they can't get an answer about that either, and they want to, an answer to that because they're worried, because Alec has been talking about structuring fees, and they're worried he may be trying to hide assets because of the boat case, and they don't want to be a part of that. Monday, June 7th? Yes. What year? 21. June 7th, 2021. What happened? went to look for Alec, and when I got upstairs, he was standing outside of his office leaning on a file cabinet, and he looked at me with a, a pretty dirty look, one I'd not seen before, and said, what do you need now? Um, clearly disgusted with me, which kind of raised my hackle, so I said, well, let's go in your office and talk about it. We, when we went in his office, I said, I told him, I said, I have reason to believe that you received the Ferris money directly to you, and you need to prove to me that you did not. And um, he assured me again that the money was in there. I told him I still needed to see the ledgers or the proof that it was. Again, he told me the money was in there, that we could get it any time. Said he was trying to leave it in there to decide what to do as far as structuring some more money or putting more money in Maggie's name. You you asked him for proof, is that correct? Yes. Proof that he didn't have that money. Yes. 
Did you were you able to complete that conversation on the morning of June seventh, twenty twenty one? It was actually the afternoon of June seventh. Afternoon. But no, we were not able to complete it during the middle of our conversation. Um, he took a phone call, and the call was saying that his father was in the hospital and that there was nothing more that could be done, and he was terminal. So at that point, you know, I've known Alec for since I was 16 years old, known the family forever, it turned into a personal conversation about how's your dad doing, how's everything doing, you know, what's going on. And I basically thought he was leaving to go to the hospital to attend to his father, so I left the office at that time and we did not discuss the money anymore. You thought he was leaving to go? I thought he was gonna go to see about his father. Um. He had gotten a phone call about his father June 7th, 2021, correct? That's right. Was anybody at all concerned about those missing fees after those murders happened? We weren't because we were concerned about L.A. We weren't going to go in there and harass him about money when his family had been killed. Did you have a conversation with Alec later on that day? We did. Around 4 o'clock, my phone rang, and I remember because I was surprised that he was still there. And Alec was asking me some information about his 401k balance. And why was he doing that? He was doing that because he stated he had to get some documents and financials together for a hearing regarding the boat wreck later that week. He needed his own financial information for a hearing for the boat case that week, correct? That's correct. <clears throat> Paul was caught on security camera in a convenience store buying $50 worth of alcohol that night. He used his brother Buster's driver's license because he was underage. It was to be an afternoon of fun for these six young people. Nobody saw the tragedy coming. Paul and Connor decided to go into this bar for a drink. He just was very persistent about going up to Luther's and getting a shot. He was out of his mind drunk. Uh, he just is a whole other person when he's drunk. Murdoch stumbles on the dock as he and his friends return to the boat around 1 a.m. Paul was just driving, doing donuts. Stops Connor and he's like, no, this is my boat, like, let me drive. I saw the bridge coming. I heard a scream and then a bang. Oh, what bridge is this? And then that's when we all started screaming for Mallory. Alec wasn't worried about finding Mallory. He wanted to make sure that lips were sealed. They were more worried about a cover-up. I think that from day one, ground zero, the effort was, what can we do to get Paul out of this? Alex reportedly went from room to room to try to communicate with the other boat crash passengers and get them all on the same page. Hospital security guard said he overheard Alex Murdoch on his cell phone say, she's gone, don't worry. About two hours after the crash, Murdoch's BAC sat at 0.286. That's more than three times the legal limit. Authorities, search teams, friends and family searched for an entire week until 911 we're on the search team we think we found her Later that month, her family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Alec and Buster Murdoch, plus Parker's convenience store, who sold Paul the alcohol the night of the crash. Well, in the community, some thought he's going to get away with it. He's Murdoch. Nearly two months after the boat crash, 
on what would have been Mallory's 20th birthday, Paul was charged with three felony counts, including boating under the influence of alcohol or drugs and causing the death of Mallory Beach. He pleaded not guilty. Pleading not guilty. Thing to say about that, about why he decided to plead not guilty? Because he's not guilty. The court ordered mediation in the wrongful death lawsuit failed on June 4th, 2021, meaning the case would then head to trial. Three days later, Paul and his mother Maggie are found shot to death at their family's hunting lodge. This is the firearm you brought from inside the house? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I went and get, this is a long story. My son was in a boat wreck a, a few months back. He's okay. been getting threats. Most of it's been benign stuff we didn't take serious. Okay. Um, you know, he, he's been getting, like, punched. <laughs> um, I know that's somebody, I know that's what it is. The death of 19-year-old Mallory Beach has been described as the catalyst for the downfall of the Murdoch dynasty. In the wake of this tragedy, the Murdoch family was brought back into the spotlight with negative publicity, criminal charges against Paul, and an over $10 million lawsuit against the powerful family. When we talk about the boat case as it pertains to the trial of Alec Murdoch, we're really referring to both the criminal and civil cases. As we know, Paul was awaiting trial at the time of his death, but after his not guilty plea in May 2019, he was out on a $50,000 personal recognizance bond and nothing progressed further in the case before his death. He never spent a night in jail, nor was he ever placed in cuffs. As a formality, the charges were dropped in August 2021 following his death. As for the civil case, I imagine this was the more pressing of the two matters in Alex's mind during the spring and early summer of 2021. Beach's family and other survivors of the boat crash were suing Alec Murdoch over Mallory's death, alleging that the father had been negligent. Mark Tinsley, the lawyer who filed the wrongful death lawsuit, testified that Murdoch had a progressive insurance policy for the boat that would pay $500,000 per victim, a small dent in the $10 million he sought from Murdoch. Tinsley said he was told by Murdoch's defense he'd only be able to cobble together about $1 million, but that he was ultimately broke. Tinsley said that given Murdoch's steady flow of cases in Hampton County, real estate holdings, and generational wealth, he found it hard to believe that he was broke. As he tried to pressure Alec to settle the case, Tinsley said he warned him that mock juries to whom they had presented the lawsuit had been extremely sympathetic to the Beach family. Alec, though, continued to insist he was broke and can only really, quote, cobble together $1 million. But Tinsley said he found this impossible to believe because he knew that Alec was continuing to make money as an attorney. When Alec continued to stonewall, Tinsley filed a court motion in October 2020 asking the judge to force Alec to list all his bank accounts and finances, which would not have gone well based on his various schemes and sketchy transactions over the last decade that we previously talked about. After various delays, the hearing on that court motion was scheduled for June 10th, 2021, just three days after the murders. What day was the uh, motions hearing that included the motion to compel rescheduled for? June 10th, 2021. How'd you hear about the murder of Maggie and Paul? I got a phone call sometime in the middle of the night, 1130, after my recollection, from Judge Hall's law clerk, uh, Judge Hall's over the boat crash case, to uh, me and the lawyer for Parker's as well as um, about the fact that the hearing's not going forward. All right, this time I'd offer states for us. What's the date of that email? June 8th, uh, 2021. What time? 424 p. That period of time, was there any date set in the wake of all of this for, for it to be reheard? There was not. Um, in the wake of the murders, did you generally understand or, or have an idea of at least what had happened to Maggie and Paul, how they had been killed? I just, did. Just from media reports and the rest of it? That's right. And did that have any effect, that tragedy of their deaths, did that have any effect on your assessment of the boat case and how everything fit together uh, if things were how they initially appeared? Uh, it would have affected. I mean, it, it, yes, it did, and it would have. It would have ended the case. 
that would have ended the case against who? Against Alex Murnick. And explain that to the jury. Why? What had changed after this terrible tragedy? Well, when you have a civil case, um, if you nice people get good verdicts, okay, just generally speaking. Yes, sir. Uh, nice people get good verdicts. Uh, you, you, you really have to motivate uh, a jury to want to help somebody in a civil case. And so if you compared, say, Attila the Hun with some sweet grandmother, who gets a better result? It's the sweet grandmother. If Alec is the victim of a vigilante, nobody's going to hold him accountable. doesn't make any difference what he did or how clearly what he did contributed. Uh, the case would be over against Alec. And, and so initially, um, it, was, it could have been over. It, it appeared that it, would, it was going to be over against Alec because uh, I had other defendants. I had Parker's convenience store that clearly violated its rules. And so uh, you, you wouldn't want a very sympathetic person in your case. Uh, when you have somebody who clearly violated the rules and caused this tragedy. So I, it would have been over against him. The sympathies of the case had changed if Alec had truly been, the, his family had been the victim of some vigilante or something like that. The sympathies would have changed if that had been true. And assessing those sympathies and those emotions in a case like this is what, what you do as a plaintiff's lawyer, is that correct? It, it, it's what we try to do. And that's one Alec Murdoch used to do as well when he was a plaintiff's lawyer. I think he was good at reading people and knowing what made them tick. And I say again, I respect this court, but I'm innocent. I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my wife Maggie, and I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my son Pawpaw. Well, and it might not have been you. It might have been uh, the monster you become when you uh, take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 opioid pills. Maybe you become another person. Um, I've seen that before. The, the, the person standing before me was not the person who committed the crime, though it's the same individual. Um, we'll leave that at that. Did Maggie have a nickname for Paul? Uh, as little, um, what does detective? Little detective? Mm -hmm. And what did that mean? She um, felt like that he was always looking to make sure his dad was um, behaving. And what specifically was the concern? Pills. Prescription pain pills. And that's why, you know, who, who um, um, Paul was with. I want to tell you one thing while yeah. I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Paul was really an incredibly intuitive little dude mm -hmm. and I mean he was like a little detective and I mean Paul would you know he you, you know what yeah. I'm trying to say yeah and what did specifically little detective mean as it related to the pills if there were pills in the house that his dad was taking that he wasn't supposed to Paul was determined that he would find them. And did that happen on occasions? I think so, yes. It had been going on for years, years. And so they had been watching me like a hawk for years um, before May. May was just one occurrence where I let them down again. Uh, this time in May, that wasn't the only time that Paul found pills or Maggie found pills. Is that correct? Now, there were a number of times where Mags found pills, Paul Paul found pills, Bus found pills. I mean, it was an ongoing 
It was just an ongoing battle for me. Maggie or Paul had found pills, and Paul had come to me and asked me, and I told him, you know, I was back on the pills. Um, so whether you believe Alex's testimony or not, that he was taking up to 2,000 milligrams of oxycodone per day, I personally don't. I think he greatly exaggerated this value to perhaps explain away money that he allegedly stashed away to hide from the Beach family or money that may be tied up in some other sketchy dealings. Whether you believe him or not, it is clear that Alec was dealing with a pretty gnarly opioid addiction at the time of the murders and about two decades prior. His family was well aware of his addiction, and Paul in particular was known to confront him about it whenever he found pills on his dad. This makes me wonder if there was perhaps a confrontation that night down at the kennels over his addiction. I can only imagine that with the mounting financial pressures, as well as the emotional toll of losing his terminally ill father later that week, whom he'd always been very close to, it's possible that at that point he was heavily reliant on painkillers due to the stress of all of these factors converging. It's also been reported by People Magazine that Maggie saw a divorce attorney in Charleston not long before the murders, though these claims have not been independently verified. But I do think Maggie was starting to catch on to his financial misdeeds and just how bad his addiction really was. Admittedly, the prosecution's theory for motive in this case appears a bit weak and even far-fetched on paper. That a man would kill his wife and son for sympathy or to avoid accountability or, or avoid exposure for financial transgressions. But as prosecutor Creighton Waters reminded us in his closing statement that these are not normal circumstances because Alec Murdoch is not a normal person. And it's clear that the evidence, when viewed in its totality, paints a picture of a desperate man who is willing to do anything to buy himself a little more time. And in the end, that's exactly what he got in the form of two life sentences.